I'm Lama Tantrapa. Welcome to our masterclass with Dr. Simeon Roger of Ottawa, Canada. He's been practicing Qigong and Tai Chi since 1981 and has taught thousands of people worldwide as the author and producer of programs like Rock Solid Tranquility, The Practice of Hara, Rock Solid Health Qigong, The Ocean of Energy, Leveraging Tai Chi, and many more. His more sedate side has expressed itself as a university professor, a married priest of Eastern Orthodox Church, and a best-selling author on the personal transformation methods of ancient traditions. On the more edgy side, Simeon is a martial artist, an expert as, as a certified emergency management professional, and trained in counterterrorism by veterans of the U.S. and Israeli Special Forces. Welcome to our masterclass, Dr. Simeon Roger. It's really great to have you here. Oh, well, thank you very much. I really appreciate it. It's it's great to be here. I see there are a lot of commonalities between uh, your uh, approaches and, and even personal story uh, as compared to mine. So there are probably a lot of things that we can talk about. But as always, my first question is, tell us about your origin story. How did you get into uh, the arts of Tai Chi and Qigong? It's, I guess it's a little bit complex, but really the truth is, uh, so I always had a martial arts interest. That was definite. Um, and as you know, maybe as we'll see a little bit later, I had a, a major health challenge, which really kind of drove that side of it, but it wasn't the only thing that did. Um, and I was very much interested in the spiritual aspect as well, you know, really into looking at, at different schools of Taoism, looking at different schools of Buddhism, in addition to, you know, studying the ancient Christian, uh, the ancient Eastern Christian mystical tradition. So looking at all of those, it was kind of all of that. But so in my in my youth, yeah, I was doing martial arts. I did judo since I was like 10 years old. Um, and then I got in in my teenage years, I got into some Chinese uh, boxing uh, Wing Chun specifically, a bit of Shaolin, um, loved Wing Chun, still do, uh, ended up in university, trapped in a karate class because it was the only game in town in a small, very small city. Um, and, but when I was in university, I actually came across an opportunity to study Tai Chi, and that was the first time I'd really come across a concrete opportunity, you know, that one had just presented itself right into my face. And it turned out to be a master's student, an engineering master's student, who had spent uh, about a year in Taiwan, and he had been studying the Qing Man Qing form, right? So what you would might call a simplified version of New Yang, right? Of the newer, more simplified Yang style. And uh, of course, I, I didn't know all those intricacies then. I, I knew it was, I probably knew it was Yang style, whatever the heck that meant, but I knew it was Tai Chi, and that was enough. So he was, uh, there was a small group of us and he walked us through the form. And, you know, so we, we got, you know, fairly okay with it. I wouldn't say proficient. He was, he was fairly competent. I mean, you know, as what do you need in a teacher? You need someone who, who's better than you are, who knows more than you do. That's a start. And he certainly was that. And uh, so from there, after, you know, after I left university, left, left that particular uh, venue and actually for the following three years left the country, ended up studying elsewhere, studying in the United States. Um, <clears throat> then it kind of, you know, went by the wayside a little bit in those early years. Although <clears throat> the good part was I'd already had, because of this Qigong uh, or Tai Chi experience, I had also been exposed to Qigong. And I'd been exposed to a little bit of Qigong doing Chinese boxing, but it wasn't anything much. You know, it was kind of the typical Western obsession with, with martial arts or specific techniques, as opposed to the underlying generation of, of power and overall personal resilience that kind of gets ignored. And so when I came back to Canada, I continued, you know, looking at uh, various alternatives. Uh, I continued doing a little bit of uh, a bit of Yang style uh, and really delved into Qigong at this point. 
Um, Qigong began to fascinate me. So I, I gobbled up, you know, pretty much everything I could um, and had some really, really good experiences with certain types of Qigong. Uh, I would say, um, just to throw it out there for fun, Iron Shirt. Iron Shirt was my first wow experience of Qigong, the first time I'd done something and I thought, wow, this feels different. <laughs> what was so, different about it? Um, it, was a it was a feeling of being sort of very solid, very powerful. Um, and, you know, I, I did test it in, in martial arts uh, venues to see does this actually work well yeah it does work it's advertised actually <laughs> pretty much um so I, I was doing various types of, of qigong um continued with yang style tai chi uh eventually graduated to the the yang cheng fu form so uh of the new yang sort of school that was the the original form the whole the whole shebang the whole enchilada the 108 um did that for several years um, with a teacher who was interested in the martial aspect. So there were some some very good points that came out of that. He also taught us the second form, the second yang form, which almost nobody seems to know. Um, and I don't claim to know it right now anymore, <laughs> but it was what it was. Um, I was also introduced to Chen style in that period, which was Huh. A, I would say a real game changer for me uh, in so many ways. And, uh, but continued with both Yang and Chen and, and Qigong. And, and, you know, looking at this from a, a really sort of holistic point of view, what does, yes, I'm interested in the martial arts aspect, but I'm interested in the health aspect and I'm interested in the overall aspect because this is one of the big problems we find in our culture. We, we are very, not only very cerebral, but we're very segmented. Right. If I have a, a mindset question, I look for a mindset expert. If I look for, a, if I have a health question, I look for a health expert. If I look for, if I'm martial arts inclined, I look for that. And it never occurs to most people that you have a psychophysical organism. Okay, it's it is what it is. And really, the whole purpose of all of this is to optimize that psychophysical organism so that you connect better and better with yourself, your real self with other people, with the environment, with the universe, with the with the Tao, if you want to put it that way, with the absolute reality. And so it was, I was always looking at things from this holistic point of view, which meant that not too many people around me had any idea what I was on about or interested in. But uh, I was very fortunate also at one point to uh, run into a kindred spirit here in Ottawa, where I live, who, uh, guy named Doug, who uh, became my push hands practice partner. Every We pushed hands probably every week for 15 years straight, roughly. Very good. Uh, and he was a, he's a Wu style instructor. And of course, as I said, I'm young and Chen and I actually don't like Wu style that much, but I've told him that he's good with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I learned, I still learn things because Wu style has its own peculiarities as every style does. And so that really impressed upon me the the fact that having someone to practice with makes a huge difference. Uh, so yeah. yeah, that was kind of the the whole origin story in a nutshell. Well, excellent, and that obviously uh, is a, a, a really really good uh, demonstration or uh, a storyline of how it's not preferred it's, it's not advisable even uh, to stick with one style forever now some traditionalists would scoff at this or even hate me for saying this but being locked in one style is the bane of a lot of traditional martial artists i'm not the first one to talk about it bruce lee talked about it in the 1970s so, exactly uh, luckily i managed to pick up right where bruce lee left off in this capacity. However, I lived longer than him because I'm not as confrontational as him. Uh, what I want to uh, dive deeper into is your rather uh, un unorthodox or um, other than mainstream approach to the teaching these arts. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, I think I think my approach to the teaching 
you know, I think for all of us, our approach to teaching comes out of our own learning experiences. And we look at what worked, we look at what didn't, mm -hmm. um, or what's suboptimal. And, and the good thing, the good part is there's a lot of suboptimal around to build on, which is good, makes you think. Uh, so I, I had a number of sort of what I would call, uh, you might call them sort of seminal moments or moments of, oh, now I get it. Uh, aha these, these, Yeah, aha moments, truly aha moments. I mean, one of them uh, took place during, a, it was during a, a, a Chen workshop and Chen style workshop. And the the guy who was teaching it was was uh, from the old country and he, and he was, uh, you know, um, had very definite ideas but very competent in this case. And he, <clears throat> at one point, you know, we were working with our partners. We were just doing stuff, whether it was sort of push hands or just working on applications or, or whatever. And at one point he just stopped the whole workshop because someone had gone up to him and had asked a question. He just said, okay, guys, stop. He said, look, you've got to stop asking me to show you the next form. You've got to stop asking me to show you the second form, the uh, the cannon fist, the uh, uh, the sword form, the spear form, the you know I don't know what. He said, "Look, you're you're culturally programmed to go wide, and I'm going to tell you something else." He said, "I want you to go deep. Wide does not matter. Stop collecting things. Instead, work on what you with what you've got, and you'll find the depth." of it, which is incredible. There's incredible depth there, but if you keep going along the surface, you'll never go down. You'll never drill down. You'll never get the benefit of all that. And as an illustration, he said, look, back where I came from, traditionally, if you came to us to learn Tai Chi, you would not even be allowed to see the form. So the form in the sense of, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, it's, uh, and your viewers probably do, but a form being like a, like a kata in karate or you know, a, a series of moves strung together. And that's what you see people doing when they are practicing Tai Chi in the park and all that. Um, Chinese, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so he said, you know, they're, they, they wouldn't even be allowed to see the form. We wouldn't show them. They might spend six months just sitting in a, or standing rather in a low horse stance, which is probably the most uncomfortable thing you can do but that would build enormous lower body strength and solidity. So they get their lower body very solid. They essentially, they're building the foundation. He said, you know, it's like building a house. Obviously you build a house, you want a strong foundation. And then he said, maybe for the next six months, they'll just work on one move, on one thing. It might be how to deliver power. It might be just that how to deliver power. And they might just do that over and over 10,000 times against a bag or something. Um, and he said, think of it this way, by your standards, that person doesn't know Tai Chi, right? Because they don't know the form. They don't know all that pretty stuff. Uh, but any one of them could throw any one of you through a wall. So who knows Tai Chi, them or you? you have to ask yourself. And that really was, okay, yeah, go, go deep, not wide. As Bruce Lee at some point said something to the effect of, not being afraid of somebody who learned 10,000 kicks and mm -hmm. done those kicks once each. He was afraid of somebody who learned one kick and practiced it 10,000 times. Exactly. Yeah, and it's, it's more than just the martial art aspect as well, isn't it? It's, it's really, if you want to understand the incredible dynamics that go into this, the dynamics of alignment, the dynamics of breath, the dynamics of energy transfer, uh, and get all those benefits, you, you have to go deep. You can't just group float along the surface all day uh, and collect forms. So that was one of the, one of the big moments. Uh, the next aha moment I think occurred when I was, I was in a hotel in Toronto. I was at a conference that had nothing to do with any of this. <clears throat> and I was just reading a book. And this book, uh, you may know it, it was, it was uh, um, Carl Fried Durkheim's book called Hara. And I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. So Durkheim was a, one, a German who had been in Japan between the wars, much like uh, Eugen Herigl, the author of Zen and the Art of Archery, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
So Durkheim wrote a book in, on what he had studied in Japan, which was entirely about the cultivation of your primary energy center in the lower abdomen, uh, which the Japanese, Japanese refer to. Lower Dantian. Yeah, lower Dantian in Chinese, and the Japanese turned Dantian into Tanden mm -hmm. as a word, but they also use the word Hara, which is simply the word for belly. And so he talked about all of this and the depth of what he was explaining was, was so far beyond anything I have read on that subject before or since that it blew me away. And I thought to myself, I got to put this to the test. I really got to, I'm going to, I'm going to practice this for like the next three months. I'm going to put this to the test as much as I could, given the fact that the book is more philosophical than educational, <laughs> not that much about the concrete, what to do. Um, so I had to develop some, some, uh, approaches, but the feeling you get from that, the ability to, uh, to, to drop down into that abdominal center is phenomenal. It really gives you, um, not only a sort of feeling of solidity, but it's, it's solidity. It's not just physical. It's more, it's more like your completely 100% secure because it's a kind of surrender. It's not really a kind of let's shove energy down there as much as we can until it nearly explodes. It's surrendering more to what's already there. And thinking rather it, than forcing it. Yes, and it, it calms the monkey mind down almost completely. Uh, and so that uh, the ability to do that just, it, it gives you a different, uh, what I would call a different life feeling. Right. So it's a different experience of what life is. So that was the second one. What's and the difference the, between the experiencing life uh, from Hara as opposed to from head or some other part of the body? Yeah, much different because, of course, we're all in the head, right? In the West, typically we're very cerebral and we assume that the only source of intelligence in the body is the brain and that the body is essentially a transportation system for the brain. Instead of, you know, realizing as we do now, even scientifically, we have a brain in the head. We have also a large neuro neuron complex in the heart and in the gut. And each of these is a kind of a different access to a different type of intelligence, a different type of, a, a different ability to connect. Uh -huh. And it's, and those things can only be, you know, they, they can only be known by experience. The same way if you're meditating and you meditate on the heart center, you get a very different feeling a different way to connect, if you will. Um, so, so it's was really like that. What was the difference in the experience? <clears throat> for which, for Hara? Yes. For, for, for Hara, it's, it's, as I said, it's kind of this feeling of being connected to, connected to the earth, connected to, to the environment. It's a, it's a, it's less of a, for instance, when you focus on the heart center, you, you have a more compassionate energy being activated. The, the belly is not, not com, it's not non-compassionate, but it's more of a, it's a different quality of energy. And I think every, all of the body's main energy centers have their own quality. Um, but it does make a difference. And of course it makes a huge difference from the point of view of, of practicing something like Qigong or Tai Chi. So being able to move from the Dangyan as opposed to just, you know, the kind of disconnected movements we always tend to do, but moving as a whole with that, you know, that Tai Chi maxim, when one part moves, all parts move. Um, but where do they move from? Well, ideally and typically from the lower Dangyan, at least to an extent. Now you can play with that, modify it, and there's more to it than that, but... <laughs> There is much more to it. As a matter of fact, um, as a practitioner of Tibetan Qigong, I do not adhere to the Chinese system of three Dantians, but rather work with mm -hmm. all the chakras, which are the energy centers in the body and also around the body. But uh, the main six ch chakras uh, along uh, the central channel mm -hmm. that are located in the body Yep. are definitely associated with very different states of consciousness and also manifest differently somatically. So mm -hmm. the ability of a person to move in one direction or another and with one type of movement or another 
will be either enhanced or hampered depending on which energy center they're operating from. So that's definitely yeah. something that I, I concur that it makes a huge difference. Now, if you don't mind, maybe you can tell us a bit more about any particular experiences um, that are distinct in your method of training as opposed to other methods. Well, I would say, you know, just the, the last story I wanted to mention, it, it as a little bit of background, I suffered uh, terribly uh, as a sort of teenager in my young adult life from anxiety. I was absolutely anxiety ridden and to the point of almost being paralyzed at times. And, and way back then, because there was so little, in, so, so little information about stress and the manifestations of stress and because the internet, well, they began pre-internet for those who are old enough to remember that. And, and of course, even in the early, you know, the first decade of the internet, there really wasn't much online about this kind of thing. So nothing like what we have now. And so uh, I, there was a specific incident where I, I was, uh, I had to go out to a social engagement uh, in, I was a Saturday morning, had to go out to a social engagement. Uh, and I just had a massive panic attack. And I, I actually, from an intellectual point of view, I didn't know why. I couldn't figure out what, what, would, what, what had me afraid of this. But the body has its own ideas. And sometimes the head doesn't get the message. So, <clears throat> you know, we, we went to this engagement and afterward, my uh, wife dropped me off at my Tai Chi class for the afternoon. And so, you know, okay, Tai Chi, 45 minutes or whatever, doing the yang form, plus 45 minutes of various other things. And that calmed me down. Okay, I was, I was sort of put back together. But at that point, all I was getting from Qigong and Tai Chi in terms of stress relief when it had to do with this, this pre-existing trauma uh, all I was getting was relief. I was not getting resolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, I was at a, a, a workshop where um, another Chen workshop, same same Chen style master. And uh, just before the workshop started, uh, a young lady who was coming to the workshop, she'd driven all the way from Toronto. So she'd been on the road for probably five hours. She probably had to get up at three in the morning to to come. She was she came and she was talking to him and his face really lit up like he was just like, wow. And this was kind of unusual. So people sort of stopped and thought, what is he on? What? <laughs> He's never smiled before. Anyway. Um, and fortunately, though, I was kind of standing in the vicinity and, and I heard what she said. And she said, well, it was something like this. She said, as you know, I, I had this incredible experience in the car. It was like my physiology became part of the vehicle or the vehicle became part of my physiology. And I, she said, I could play with minute adjustments of my, my alignments and feel different things. But it was like we were, I was one thing. And then when I got out of the car, it was like I was this big ball of energy. This is what I felt. She said, am I, am I, is this like anywhere should this be happening to me? And he said, this is exactly what you should be feeling. Because the, the whole point here is this, the whole point of all of this is to give you this, a completely new, different life feeling. The whole point is that practice is not what we do for 20 or 30 minutes a day. Practice is what your life becomes. And yes, yeah, so exactly that. You should you should be able to feel these dynamics when you're brushing your teeth or getting the orange juice out of the fridge or whatever. It's 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 not it's not something you isolate in your you know in your very isolated Western mind. Um, yeah. So the woman really, essentially didn't even have to go to the workshop anymore. She got the benefits <laughs> that she was supposed to get even before the workshop started. She just had to go for a drive. Who knew? <laughs> exactly. Well, but um, knowing how that is actually facilitated or what are the uh, precursors of this type of events to not every time you go for a drive you're going to feel one with everything so there's going to be something else either uh, in her personal experience in her memory in her mental state or perhaps energetically or physically or even dietarily she must have done something that 
precipitated that kind of experience. Do you know whether she ever figured it out? And that could well be, but I have no idea if she figured it out. But to me, as the person listening, it was kind of, you know, as I said, I'd only had resolution, never, or sorry, only had relief, never resolution uh, mm -hmm. when it came to stress. And then I thought, wow. And I kind of took this to heart, you know, if you can kind of be in this, this space as much as possible. And so that, you know, the waking hours of your day are in a sense devoted to, uh, to this sort of paradigm that this tradition gives you, what would that do? And I found it was, it, it was incredibly helpful to me. Not that I was ever perfect at it or, or, you know, you get better with time, but at the beginning hit and miss maybe, but still a huge, huge improvement. Hmm. So did you resolve uh, your uh, anxiety for good or um, does it still bother you sometimes? It's pretty much resolved at this point and has been for a number of years. By what uh, means? Sorry? By what means? By what means? Um, I think this, this simply being able to convert the waking hours of the day into useful training mm -hmm. in the sort of Tai Chi Qigong paradigm uh, made a huge difference. Now, it wasn't the only thing I tried. Uh, I tried other energetic things as well, but I think this may have made the biggest difference. Uh, oh, nice. Now, my case was kind of unique because not everybody has some sort of pre-existing trauma they got hit with in childhood, but or not the same one. But but I think what the the, the master was saying was you know, essentially, if your only practice is, say, 20 to 30 minutes a day, let's say 30 minutes, and you are awake for another 15 hours and 30 minutes, well, you're, you're always training. Anything you do in life is actually training. You go through your life as you wish, but you're training your psychophysical organism to respond in certain ways and to carry itself in certain ways. And all of that will have repercussions. So would you like to choose consciously or would you like to just drift along the way you have been? And if you drift along the way you have been in those 15 hours and 30 minutes that you're awake, the mere 30 minutes of your practice is going to be overwhelmed by that. Absolutely. As a matter of fact, you be backsliding as soon as you're done practicing. That's why yeah. I always say, look, I don't want to just teach you another Qigong style. I want to teach you a Qigong lifestyle. This is something that I'm very serious about, and I use exactly the same analogy. Look, if you practice once or twice a week for an hour or two, well, what happens the rest of six days and 22 or 23 hours <laughs> throughout the rest of the week? <laughs> That's when it really matters. And uh, that example of a woman entering the flow state, um, the mm -hmm. state of uh, energy awareness, uh, as I defined, a qigong state the state of ability to perceive energy and be in the flow of it and so that basically was kind of a spontaneous event for her maybe as a result of sleep deprivation as you said but the idea is that it's possible to learn how to do this on demand and practice it mm -hmm. turn it into an ongoing spiritual and physical practice now yeah, that's just it is let me ask you about um, the practices that uh, um, you offer to other people. Um, what type of practices do you teach or, or uh, introduce people to? Essentially, what, what I like to do with people, and I find this is what seems to get the best results, is to begin, uh, to begin really dealing with alignment dealing with postural alignment. Um, so people first learn to actually to stand properly. And, you know, everybody thinks they can stand just the way everybody thinks they can breathe, neither of which is true. Mm -hmm. So we walk people through, okay, this is, this is, you know, this is proper posture. This is what it feels like. Yeah, it's going to feel weird. It's going to feel strange. However, when you test it, when you test the alignment, you'll see the difference. You'll actually feel the difference. If you get somebody, if you're able to train with somebody, just any other person, they don't even need a lot of experience to help you with this part, to test your alignment. Um, 
then you'll see you can and you can verify that you've done the alignment properly and you'll see what it does uh you'll have far better balance for one thing uh you're but it that isn't the only purpose of course alignment is there to optimize the flow of everything in the body the flow of energy or chi the flow of all of the body bodily fluids whether it's spinal fluid uh whether it's nerve signals whether it's blood whether it's lymph whether it's synovial fluid whatever it is so you're optimizing your psychophysical structure the better your body works the better your brain works the better your brain works the better your nervous system works etc cetera, etc cetera. <clears throat> um the better your joints work the better your energy flows all of these things they work together synergistically but they can only be accomplished through uh through alignment but alignment's only a first step right because life is not static life is movement and eventually we get into movement we do we do get people to um work on meditation uh in the sense of identifying their different energy centers and just being able to relax deeply which helps the energy to drop and this helps them cultivate breathing patterns that help them too because as you know most people are breathing in their chest all day breathing high and you know i tell people look if you're ever in a you know a meeting of any kind or you're on public transit just watch the shoulders of people hmm. <laughs> So they shouldn't be happy neck muscles. Sorry. So they're breathing with their neck muscles with the scalings. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And some people have said well it actually takes more energy to breathe this way than the energy you can extract from the oxygen you can take in. Hmm. Not sure if that's how if how that's been proven but uh it's that kind of breathing as we know is associated with anxiety with increased monkey mind activity um essentially then, the central nervous yeah. system is so busy sending a lot of signals of contraction to the muscles that don't really need to work that hard if they're uh, engaged properly and the whole body is kept in a relatively reasonable level of alignment yeah. and then because the central nervous system is agitated it basically tenses up the diaphragm because the diaphragm is one of those muscles that receive too many signals of contraction so it contracts well if the diaphragm is too tense obviously you're going to re recruit some other muscles to compensate for that tension so basically that's an easy way to understand how this shallow stressed breathing comes about the question is do we need to work on breathing exercises to correct our breathing method or do we want to address the root cause of why this breathing is happening this way so that it becomes natural and spontaneous yeah and it this is you know what i really try to aim at is okay we're looking for a state we're not just looking for breathing practice you know don't just sit here for 10 minutes and do normal abdominal breathing or reverse abdominal breathing but think about how this can become simply your default setting the way your body breathes all the time the way as in the way a young child breathes before they become indoctrinated into the uh adult world of uh you know merciless competition and get anxious and learn how dangerous life allegedly is and then start doing that um so yeah yeah get them you know work on alignment make people at least conscious of what alignment is what breathing is how these things can fit together and at that point then i will get them moving um okay you have to you know as i said life is not static life is movement uh yeah and you do get people i know you do get people who say oh i i much prefer qigong to tai chi cuz with qigong i can just stand there in one place with whatever you know typical of many qigong sets you just stand in one place and you do something right and mm -hmm. uh and i i i do think that's really limiting a person's progress uh the ability to move is is kind of critical because you're you you have a structure okay you've got a structure now that's that's right or correct or better than what it was now you simply need to make that structure move and that to me that's part of the genius of tai chi uh as as just as a a modality that even the simplest most stripped down forms of tai chi um are useful in this vein as vehicles and but that's the way i look at them it's a vehicle it's a container it's not a thing in itself 
Uh, and that doesn't really matter what you're studying Tai Chi for, whether you're interested in martial arts or health or stress relief or any combination of these, but that because it is a, an incredible container into which you can pour content. And there are many types of content, including each one of those postural adjustments, you know, however, you know, depending how you want to count them, the six or seven main postural adjustments you would make from, from the crown down to the perineum, down to perhaps the knees and the feet. And, but there's more than that, right? There's, of course, there's ability, the ability to, well, what would happen if you focused on, um, on rooting or focused on feeling the solidity of the lower body and the lightness of the upper body? What would happen if you um, focus on, on just the energy field around your body? Can you perceive it? Um, it's what they what call happens the, if you- The external right? G. Yeah. Yeah, and, and that's happen? wonderful because uh, a lot of practitioners of Qigong go gaga about Neigong, the internal practices. And very few actually get proficient with Wei Gong or external practices. Working with Wei Qi, basically it becomes almost overlooked or even dis disregarded, dismissed kind of uh, aspect of energy practices which creates imbalance, just like yin and yang need to be in balance. So is internal and external practices need to be in balance. So they think Neigong is sexier, basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's a temptation, of course. And, uh, you know, I think uh, one thing that comes they, to mind it's is- It's even sexier. Um, if you are practicing Wei Gong, you can mm -hmm. actually be a lot sexier because you are paying attention to what's happening on the outside, but paying attention on what's happening on the inside, you can bullshit about what's happening on the inside. So you mm -hmm. can be master of Nei Gong when you don't know shit about it, simply because you can tell a good story. And that essentially is how a lot of Nei Gong teachers become teachers of Neigong <laughs> because they just tell some fun stories about what's going on on the inside and there is no way to find out whether it's true. So it's just a, um, a, a faith-based practice rather than evidence-based practice. And maybe yeah, I, you know, in that vein, I think about the uh, uh, famous book about Shaolin, Shaolin Gong Fu, um, Shaolin Temple Boxing it was written back almost 100 years ago, probably 1930s, actually, in the 72 arts of the Shaolin. And, you know, you, you tell someone the title and they think immediately, okay, it's the 72 arts. It's going to be out about the different styles of the Shaolin, you know, e eagle and crane and monkey and whatever. No, none of that. Oh, they think it's going to be about actual combat techniques. It's going to be how do you do what do whatever. No, none of that. It's all Qigong. It's all Qigong, but the division between the, the Weigong and the Negong is about 50-50, as I recall. I mean, they're very serious about the external training. Uh, and there's so there, there's very much a balance that has to be observed. Now, granted, they're doing it for martial arts purposes, but still. Well, it's really important to have uh, some way of testing. Martial arts provides a great testing ground for making sure that you're practicing something worthwhile. Otherwise, you're just wasting your time. And Shaolin Monastery wouldn't have survived for centuries of its existence if it was not practicing something that was worth its salt. True. They would not have survived at all. And <laughs> it's yeah, really so, the same thing. Same so, thing with I, the original Tai Chi forms, right? The Chen village or whatever. I mean, these people, these basically these villages, these clans developed various martial arts for their own protection and, and guarded them jealously for that reason. It was survival. Right. Well, and speaking of uh, survival and um, what works and what doesn't work, would you share your perspective on uh, any particular traps or pitfalls awaiting some of the practitioners who travel down this path? Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of pitfalls that people do fall into. Um, I'd say one of them is ignoring Jing. Jing, so vitality, translated as vitality or essence. 
Uh, and you know, you have to ask people, okay, you're obsessed with chi. Well, where does chi come from? Right? And of course, according to this tradition, chi comes from jing. Well, what is jing? So jing is the fuel you burn, your body burns, your body mind organism burns in order to create chi. Right. Uh, and where okay, so where does your fuel come from? Well, after you're born, your primary source is food. That's it. I mean, there are other things. There's sunlight, there's oxygen, there's, I don't know, negative ions and God knows what, but mostly it's food. And so you really do have to pay attention. And I, I, I can't emphasize enough how I see people going into, you know, quote unquote, internal arts, thinking this is the only thing I need to pay attention to. This is the ultimate silver bullet. Uh, there is no silver bullet. Right, you really do have to pay attention to your your diet. You want living foods in your diet, so you are, you know, as one uh, one natural healer, very successful one, once said in in the U.S. He said, "Look, there are only two things in your body that do a damn thing: enzymes and probiotics. Well, you better get some, okay? Um, so you need to be putting things in your body that actually your body actually can use, and at the same time, you need to be thinking about your physical fitness. And if you think that these practices will give you everything you need, well, they weren't designed for that. They never were designed for that. Some were, uh, obviously there are some strength training practices in Shaolin tradition, like Yi Jing Jing, for example. Um, yep. My tradition of Shambhala <laughs> warriorship definitely has a number of strength training practices that kept those warriors alive and kicking and uh, formidable, but obviously these are not very well-known methods of strength training that don't require any weightlifting or any exercise machines, but they definitely work. It's just they're not well-known and not very popular because it's, it's not easy to sell them to other people. It's easier to sell a, a set of dumbbells. Oh, well, true, it is, it is. Um, I mean, we know a lot uh, in, in many ways, we know quite a bit about physiology now that we didn't at the time or, you know, centuries ago. Uh, Yi Jin Jing, things like muscle tendon changing. Okay, they're, they're good. It, they have some limitations as exercises, but they worked at the time. Uh, you know, got the fat Shaolin monks off their butts. And, you know, from the famous story of uh, Tamo, who, you know, Bodhidharma, who taught them this stuff and wanted to, was a, appalled by how out of, out of shape they were. Um, right. you know, that's absolutely true, but it's, it's ignoring every other aspect of health, health, fitness and detoxification for that matter. Okay. Well, are you trying to optimize everything, which is really what the, the whole Taoist tradition is about. You're opt to want to optimize your, your, as we discussed at the beginning, right? Your entire psychophysical organism. So, um, that's one thing is ignoring all that. Another problem is simply failing to kind of put all the content into the container you have. So you see so many people who, at least I have, who practiced styles of Tai Chi, uh, whatever, whether it's Yang, Chen, Wu, whatever, and they may have practiced for years, but they've simply been doing the same thing for years. You know, they've simply been, okay, we'll just do this every, you know, for every class, it'll be fine. And, and it doesn't go much beyond that. And if, uh, you know, if you're the person who thinks, well, I do my Tai Chi at the same speed all the time, whatever that speed is. And, uh, and I, I just do it in a soft flowing manner and I don't think about anything else. And then at the end, I feel a little bit calmer and better. Well, yeah, you will feel a little bit calmer and better, but the truth is you're really only getting about 5% maybe of the actual benefit you could be getting if you understood that the form itself, and this applies to many Qigong forms as well, it, it's, it's, it's a container. And into that container, you can pour many, you can pour all the other elements. You know, you can own your, your, your brain can only focus on one of them at a time. That's the nature of the human brain until it becomes ingrained in, in muscle memory, in, in sort of the body's way of, of being. But, if you, for instance, if you go through the Tai Chi form, just to take any Tai Chi form, doesn't matter what, if you were to go through the form and, can, and focus your mental attention on any one of the postural adjustments or any of the other 
elements of content just one at a time, then each time you do the form, it's going to feel total. It's going to feel one way when you focus on one element or one postural adjustment. It'll feel totally different when you do it the other way. And so your this has you connecting mentally. So your mental attention is being combined with different parts of your physiology at different times for different purposes, instead of just floating kind of randomly. And that's what makes a difference. So you're integrating mind and body, and that's really what it is. You know, Taoism uh, or some schools of Taoism talk about that the, the, the main or perhaps most important part of, of achieving longevity is uh, the practice of combining energy and spirit. Well, what is that? Energy and spirit is simply combining your breath, your, which is energy, temporal manifestation of energy, with your mental attention, the temporal manifestation of spirit. So you just, in other words, just pay, pay attention to your breathing. That's all it means, really. Uh, but you have to use your mental attention to do it. So all these elements are bi mind-body integration. And you can't, <clears throat> the other funny thing about them is you can't, if you, if you are absolutely resisting any, any martial arts connection in your Tai Chi practice, like if you're resolutely saying, no, I will not do that. It's, you know, that's, that's, yeah, we don't do that. This is Qigong. This is health. This is stress relief, whatever. A lot of those benefits will, you won't get simply because you won't be focused on the right things. Again, you'll be going through the form in a kind of abstract way. But what moves chi? Well, obviously, the tradition will tell you intention moves chi. Okay, well, if no, you have no, no particular intention while you're just lazily, you know, feeling good, um, what's going to happen? So this, the whole idea of ignoring the martial arts aspect there are some, when you, when you think about the martial arts aspect, you at least begin mentally to move energy. And I'm not talking about when you actually impact somebody at all. It can be when you're on your own, the same thing. <clears throat> you're thinking about it, but it moves energy more effectively. It's a different feeling, right? And you'll, you'll root better, you'll have more stability, uh, and you'll move energy better all through the body. So all of these things go together. Absolutely. And as you very astutely mentioned, there is also the reason why there are certain moves integrated into Tai Chi forms. At least originally, they were supposed to be martial arts applications. Of course, nowadays, they've been by and large watered down to look nothing scary or effective in the context of martial arts. But the origin story of this form development was that somebody actually learned how to do things that were effective in the context of either combat or some other situation, maybe competition, but the competitions back then also were basically bare fist fighting. Pretty scary, and, yeah. And uh, uh, if you don't put to test any of you, practices any of the elements of the forms that you study you basically are doing empty practice that doesn't have the substance to it what's the substance well it's the intention behind the move why are you making this move because somebody did do this like monkey see monkey do it's essentially a non-intelligent or not particularly intelligent approach to do, doing practice. But if you understand, oh, this movement has certain application and I can test how well it works if I do it this way or if I mm -hmm. do it this way or if I do it this way or if I do it this way, yeah. and then you can understand what's going on behind the form. And that basically means you're not just practicing on a superficial level, you're penetrating deeper into the essence of the art. Now, yeah. um, penetrating into the, de uh, the essence of the art obviously takes time. And uh, hopefully we take baby steps to get to a deeper level of training, just like we don't want to jump off the deep end <laughs> into the swimming pool, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's just getting started, with these practices, whether it's Tai Chi or Qigong, 
what advice would you give them? I think if someone were, it, that's a tough question really, but if someone were, you know, said, okay, I'm interested in this, where do I start? Um, I, I think the first thing anyone should do is ask themselves the question, okay, what am I looking for? So what's my why? Why am I getting into this? Um, and it, as you know, as I said, in my own case, it can be a mix of things. It could be, or it could be just one thing you're narrowly focused on, but at least admit that's the case. And, you know, if you are, if you do find yourself, okay, I'm narrowly focused, I just want to know that I'm going to have better health or whatever. Okay. That's all right. But I would invite, I'd invite the person to kind of expand their horizons a little bit so that they understand the, the, you know, really, if you're looking for the whole enchilada, then the enchilada will open itself to you. If you're mm -hmm. very narrowly focused, you may be shutting out some of the benefit you would get even for that. I think also people have a, an almost natural bias for, uh, in this case, Chinese teachers. And, you know, and you, you can say that in reference to anything, like if you're studying karate, oh, this, this person's from Okinawa, Okinawa or Japan, they must be better. Or Taekwondo, this person's from Korea, they must be better or whatever. Um, or any country, you know, it, it is in whatever art. Uh, Oh, capoeira, if they're from Brazil, they must know it, right? So it doesn't matter what country, we have this bias and but the bias can lead us astray. So that's one thing, don't, don't get too hung up on necessarily where the person is from, but focus more on what you're interested in and what perhaps this can, can do for you. Um, Essentially, you, know, you, you are learning not something that is culturally associated with just a particular uh, type of tradition, a particular type of culture, but you're looking for the benefits that are universal for all human beings. We all want to live healthy and happy lives. Uh, then cultural biases have to be uh, set aside. And we look for the teachers who can provide the most effective and, and most elegant ways to achieve what we set out to achieve. Yeah, absolutely. At the same time, you know, I think you were alluding to this at the beginning. Don't don't be a student of one master kind of idea, uh, you know, or don't be stuck in in one narrow one narrow tradition and think this is the this is the the ultimate, the grand ultimate, the only. No, it's one expression of the whole the whole thing, and it's always good to be aware of of what else is there. Mm -hmm. um, one interesting thing too is is understand that if you have physical limitations, that's not really a problem. You can adapt what you learn to your own limitations. So, you know, just because you see somebody doing, I don't know, Chen style Tai Chi and they have a really low stance and you're thinking my knees won't take that, you know, they don't need to, right? You can adapt to your own. I came across a really cool story along those lines just a couple of days ago, I was completely unaware of it. Um, I mean, you've, anyone who knows anything about American karate, knows Bill Bill Wallace, Bill Superfoot Wallace, who was uh, instrumental in American contact karate way back in the day. Now he's in his mid seventies or something uh, and still very much alive and literally kicking. <laughs> alive and kicking. <laughs> and so there's an interview with him and I'd never heard this about him before. And I'm, you know, I'm not really big into the karate scene, never have been, but I ha this was a really interesting story. He said, look, when I first got into karate here in the United States, I, I had just seriously injured my right knee in judo. I had to get out of judo. I couldn't, and, I, and when I got into karate, I could not kick with my right leg and I still don't. So here's a guy whose name is Superfoot, who's known for, for literally knocking people out with his kicks. And he only kicks with one leg and he only ever has. <laughs> and he adapted his whole fighting style so that that leg that he kicks with would be facing them. And yeah, why they call them so, super foot, not super feet. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, you know, your own limitations don't really apply. Um, yeah, there may be some things you can't do, like, yeah, maybe you can't get into uh, some really low crouching stance or something that you see some master doing, or you can get into it, but never get up again or whatever. But, you know, that's okay. You don't have to. Um, all you know, all the benefits are still there. Right so on. those are just a few things that come to mind. Wonderful. Well, I think that 
our viewers and listeners will really appreciate your perspectives and, and your wisdom and knowledge. Perhaps some people would love to learn directly from you. Where can they learn more? Well, I'll send you a link where people can go. I, I do have a, a, a webinar I would direct people to because that's mm -hmm. where we, you know, can give them a lot more, te you know, teach a lot more things, show them a lot more things and uh, and really introduce kind of the approach that 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 we have, which is, you know, as you, as you see is, well, okay, it's not exactly mainstream, but our what I want, what I've always wanted to do is, is develop an approach that, you know, and I know you're sort of on board with this too, yeah, and always have been this, this idea that to attain a level of real competence does not take the mythical 10, 20 years. And it, as long as you're, as long as you know what you're doing. Yeah, depending on what we mean by competence, yeah. essentially, uh, I look at it that we are not on a journey to competence. We're not on a journey to mastery because there is no final destination called mastery level. Like, okay, no. now I reach the level of mastery. It's the pinnacle of my development. No, of course not. Any master worth his salt would say, no, 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 I'm the student first and foremost. Yeah. In other words, mastery is the journey, not the destination. We are on the path of mastering our art, uh, self-mastery, not on the path to mastery. So then in this case, basically what we're talking about is yes, 10 years are gonna go by. You're gonna be more masterful if you're on the path of mastering yourself and your art, but you don't have to wait for <clears throat> the significant length of time to pass to start noticing the benefits. No, that's exactly it, and it's 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 getting out of some of the the, the difficulties of the the uh, you know I've, I've I've mentioned some of the good points of the traditional pedagogy in in China, but there were some big downsides too, as as we both know, the the tendency to try to keep students as long as possible, not to show them any of the really good stuff for the first you know ten years or maybe never unless they were related to you. Um, all of this kind of thing, which led to whole styles of Tai Chi and Qigong uh, that are propagated by people who only ever got part of the story and didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, well, I think we are in the age of most arts being relatively truncated for exactly that reason. People start teaching before they attain a level of uh, proficiency uh, that used to be a must uh, in the good old days. But uh, on the other hand, teaching is also a great way to learn. So in a sense, they, if, if the teachers continue learning and continue developing themselves as they teach, they will be learning more. So they will be able to offer more advanced teachings to their students as the time goes by. And if the students pass them, and, and advance further than the teacher does, well, let's celebrate it instead of trying to hold them down. Right, then the teacher has actually succeeded. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to discuss all these wonderful topics with you. It's uh, also great uh, to introduce our viewers to your non-orthodox and, and I believe very astute approaches to the practice of Tai Chi, Qigong, and related disciplines. Um, we will put the link in the chat uh, we, uh, that will lead to the webinar, that will lead to the opportunities to dive deeper into the practices taught by Dr. Simeon Roger. I just want to wrap it up today by thanking you very much. And I look well, forward thank you very to much. I really do appreciate it. It's been wonderful. Namaste.